This video was originally fully edited with visuals from the show, but because of Sony of Japan's strict copyright, it has been blocked multiple times and completely taken down twice. In the past two weeks, I've gotten two copyright strikes on my channel, and now to avoid another, I've just scrapped the visual element. There will be some key visuals when needed, but for the most part, I overlaid gameplay from Doom Eternal since it just came out, and it now represents my eternal hatred for Demon Slayer. Maybe if enough people care, I'll upload the original video to like daily motion, but honestly, I've been working on this video for about two months and I just want to be done with it. With all that being said, enjoy the video. I am tired. I'm tired, that's it. I'm tired of the same old routine every few years. I'm tired of mainstream media getting hyped up about one show to an overwhelming point that you can't not hear about it. Over the past decade, we've seen tons of examples of this, most notably shows like Attack on Titan, Tokyo Ghoul, and Sword Art Online. Shows that skyrocket to the tops of people's favorites lists. Shows that get people who don't watch anime to give them a chance, but eventually putter out in popularity. Whether that's due to further critical analysis of these shows, or most viewers just dropping off after a while, I don't know. What I do know is that I'm here to throw my hat into the ring in that critical analysis category and tell you why Demon Slayer is one of the worst shows I've ever completed. And that's a fairly big stipulation. It's one of the worst shows I've completed, as I don't normally sit through shows I don't like, often dropping them after one or two episodes, which I had done to Demon Slayer. But to fully analyze this show and get to the root of my problems, I felt that I had to watch it to completion to make my opinions sound convincing enough. On that note, probably a lot of you watching this video like this show, and in no way is this video supposed to change your mind. It's awesome that a ton of people find themselves getting emotional or hyped up about a show they like, and I'll never tell anyone to stop liking something. I'm not trying to sway hearts here, rather I'm trying to give my take on why me and a very small minority of people don't enjoy it. I don't expect you to agree with anything I say, and I'll respect anyone's reasons for liking this show as long as you respect my reasons for disliking it. That being said, I really don't know where to start with Demon Slayer. Outside of the solid animation quality and the generally good Sakuga moments, I really don't have much good to say about the show, but I figure we can start at the same place that we all started. Part 1 the first episode. Watching the first episode of Demon Slayer in retrospect shows me all the problems this show is going to have through its run. It's boring, shallow, confusing, and altogether bafflingly generic. It starts off with a cold open, Tanjiro carrying Nezuko on his back. She's covered in blood, and he clearly looks worn out trudging through the snow. Then it cuts back to Tanjiro at home, gearing up to sell coal in town. Tomziak pro tip real quick. If a show opens with events that happen later in the story to try and get you invested in what's going to happen, that tells me that whatever happens between the start of the story and the point we're shown is material that the writer wasn't confident enough in to open with because it's probably not that interesting. Now don't get me wrong, I think this type of cold open can work in some cases. Psychopath uses it and that works to its advantage, showing us the futuristic setting the story takes place in. Thankfully for Demon Slayer, what's shown happens halfway through episode 1, but goddamn, everything before that is as uninteresting as it comes. The way the show exposits information through simple dialogue is bare bones and basic. I'm just getting information for the sake of it, but I don't really have a reason to care. The fact that there has to be this ideal family life for Tanjiro only for them all to die is the most basic premise ever. He's just going to sell charcoal, but they have to play it like he's going to be gone for a fucking decade. That's the only way to do it. They have to be introduced as lovingly as possible so you know that Tanjiro's family means everything to him. The problem is that, while they mean the world to Tanjiro, they mean absolutely nothing to me. You see them for two minutes and they're gone as quickly as they came. I don't get to know their personalities, what makes them different from each other, they all just love Tanjiro, and that's it. Their murder scene is gruesome, but I don't care. I never got to know his family before they died, which is the catalyst of Tanjiro's entire journey as a character 
character immediately. I'm given our main character's reason for what he does for the rest of the story, and I couldn't give less of a shit about it. We learn from some more fairly basic exposition that demons only come out at night and eat humans, two very important facts that are relevant through the series. With that, we also learn that demon slayers protect the public from demons, and we learn all this from some random old man who lives in town, implying that even though Tanjiro thinks demons might be a hoax, there is the notion that the public knows that demons and demon slayers both exist. We'll get to why this idea is fucking stupid later on, but for now, let's jump forward a bit in the episode. As Tanjiro is making his way back to town with Nezuko, they fall off the path and get into a slight scuffle until Tamioka shows up. He captures Nezuko, Tanjiro explains their situation to him, to which Tamioka responds with harsh criticisms about how much Tanjiro fucking sucks and a bafflingly poor excuse for a fight scene. How old is Tanjiro? Like what, at most 14? He's still a kid. His entire world has just been shattered. His entire family is dead, save for his sister who is now a demon and some douche with a sword shows up and starts bullying him for not knowing how to handle the situation. He basically tells Tanjiro he's so fucking weak that he won't accomplish anything. He doesn't give Tanjiro any type of encouraging words. He says, you suck, I don't respect you, deal with it. This doesn't make me want to root for the Demon Slayer Corps if it's just filled with guys like this. Spoilers, it is, and I definitely don't believe anyone would want to join after a display like this. Tamioka's inner monologue suggests that he's more empathetic than his words let on and is saying all this to drive Tanjiro to get stronger, but at the end of it all, he still determines that Tanjiro won't be able to heal his sister or avenge his family, so he's just gonna kill Nezuko anyway. Characters disregard any type of consistency in their thoughts and actions, a problem that will destroy most of the important characters through the series, and Tamioka's first appearance is a good example of that. At first I thought there might be some nuance to what he's doing. He yells at Tanjiro to try and get his ass in gear while on the inside he relates to Tanjiro all too well. I thought maybe he had lost his family in a similar way, and he would let the two go in the promise that Tanjiro would get strong enough to fulfill his goals. But nah, he's just like, eh, fuck it, and decides to 86 Nezuko. I could see someone make the argument, oh, well, he needed to kill her cause it would be against the rules to let her live. But like, he does it anyway, he still lets her live in the hopes that her and Tanjiro would be different, that maybe a demon and a human could live together in harmony. I could see the counter to that being, well, yeah, but he needed proof that Nezuko wouldn't hurt humans, to which I would reply, yeah. You're probably right. The only problem with that is, later on in the series when Shinobu brings up the idea that she wishes humans and demons could get along, he outright tells her that that will never happen. So what changed? Why is he being so blatantly contradictory now? Is it because he forgot? How would you forget something that important? Especially if you staked your life on it, which is revealed that he did in the Hashira meeting with the master. You'd have to imagine that he told Urokodaki that he'd stake his life on breaking the rules and Urokodaki relayed that sentiment in his letter to the master. But how could Tamioka forget that? Or maybe he didn't forget, and he just still can't believe it could happen. See, I'm asking all these questions about the character, and there are no clear-cut answers, because he flip-flops back and forth on what he believes so often that I don't know who Tamioka is. I don't know what his ideologies are, I don't know his backstory, I don't know what he's about at all. I know he's quiet and blunt. That's about it. Any type of characterization that he has is thrown together sloppily and contradicts itself, a problem that the entire cast suffers from, which leads me right into part two, the entire cast of the show. Let's be fair. Tamioka has a lot of impact on the overall plot of the show, but doesn't have the most screen time as a supporting character. That doesn't diminish his problems, but at least he's not the worst character. That dubious title belt goes to Zenitsu. It is legitimately hard for me to put into words how much I hate Zenitsu. His introduction is the most annoying thing I've ever seen. All he does is cry and complain about everything. It's not funny, it's not endearing, it's just annoying. The funny thing is, I thought Zenitsu would be my favorite character. I saw a clip of him killing some demon on Twitter and thought it looked super cool. 
He had a cool design and I was like, whoa, this guy is awesome. I'll probably like him a lot. Then when I actually got to that part in the show, I didn't give a shit. It's hard to make me not care about one of the most badass moments in a show, but somehow Zenitsu made it completely negligible by being the absolute biggest bitch in a show I already hate. But it's not just the fact that he's annoying that I hate him. It's only part of it. What really pisses me off is when we learn his backstory. Zenitsu was taken in by a former Hashira as a student to pay off a debt that he settled for him. Why his master took him on in the first place is never revealed, and I think that might have been an important detail to throw in just because of how much effort he puts into the kid. His master bends over backwards to make Zenitsu get stronger and have some confidence in himself. Even when his other students ridicule Zenitsu for wasting their master's time, he never has anything bad to say about him. He says you just gotta keep working at it and not give up. That sounds great, right? A master who has a fuck up student but believes he can do it if he keeps working at it? I'm all on board for that. But if Zenitsu is motivated by the fact that his master never gave up on him, then why is he only being influenced by him when he's dying? If he were upset because he didn't have anyone in his corner and Tanjiro came along and believed in him, I'd be more understanding. But no, he's always had someone rooting for him, but it's just when he feels like listening that he puts their words into practice. Just when it's the most convenient for the plot to give him a reason to be motivated. If he carried that attitude through his whole journey, I'd be more lenient. Like, he'd still be annoying, but at least he'd be spurred on to do things when it mattered most. But Zenitsu doesn't even carry this attitude for the rest of the season. He goes right back to being a whiny bitch as soon as the next arc rolls around. In fact, he admits he hates preserving through hardships and then complains when his bird tells him to work harder. I can't feel bad for Zenitsu at all. He says he wants to do better and change. He says he wants to stop being a coward, but then he also says he's doing everything he can already. Like, no you're fucking not. He constantly complains about doing shit just because he doesn't want to do it. Fuck you, you're trying your best. If you really wanted to change and you're not, then I guess you don't want to change that much. I can't buy into a character that has that much self-pity when they're not putting in their absolute best effort to do better. And Zenitsu always wants someone to pity his own problems when he hasn't put in any work. In episode 15, Zenitsu has to sit on the side of the road and lament that his friends didn't try and drag him along to help them. When Tanjiro tried something like that before, Zenitsu tried his absolute hardest to get out of helping and whined and complained about it the whole time. Why would anyone bring him along after that? Then instead of remembering the real reason why he should be motivated, he rushes into the spider forest because Nezuko is in there. What a great reason. So yeah, I think you get the point. I hate Zenitsu. Honestly, I could point out even more shit that sucks about him, but I need to hurry up and talk about my second most hated character. Someone probably no one would expect. Urokodaki. Urokodaki is possibly the worst mentor I've seen in any anime. You'd think because he doesn't have a ton of screen time outside of the first few episodes he couldn't be that bad, but man, he uses his time really effectively. And by effectively, I mean he does the dumbest shit imaginable. Think about this. The first impression that Urukodaki has of Tanjiro is that he'll never make it. He thinks he's too kind-hearted to be a demon slayer. At that point, he should have told Tanjiro he wasn't going to train him. See, Urukodaki has had a bad record with trainees recently, in the sense that all of them have died. After Tanjiro slices the boulder in half, he tells him he was never going to send him to the final selection because he thought Tanjiro wouldn't be able to do it, and that he did all this because he didn't want to see any more children die. My response to that is, if you felt so guilty about your students being killed, then why the fuck do you keep teaching them, asshole? And to be fair, teaching is a strong word. He doesn't teach Tanjiro anything. He tells Tanjiro how to swing a sword, something that any fuckwit could do by himself. We never see him teach Tanjiro the specific stances or whatever. He's basically just like, okay, you can swing a sword now, go cut this boulder. 
we see nothing being taught. Not only did Urokodaki not teach him anything, he also gave him a task he never expected him to fulfill. He wastes Sanjiro's time by dangling his only hope of getting stronger in his face, and then waits for him to give up on tasks he knows he won't accomplish. Also, he can avoid the death of more students. This ass-backward logic of wasting all this time instead of just rejecting them from the start makes Urokodaki look like a shitty guy. This is Tanjiro's mentor, the guy he's supposed to learn and grow from. But the way the story actually plays out, I'm more willing to say that Sabito is his real master because of the way he puts time into training him. If you have the ghost of your dead apprentice train your new one to gain any semblance of growth, you're a bad fucking teacher. See how much actual horseshit this guy gets away with, even with little screen time? What an absolute joke of a character. Now it's time for me to address the elephant in the room. The one character that's so universally loved, I don't think anyone could actually dislike this guy. Except for me. Of course, I'm talking about Inosuke. Now, I don't hate Inosuke, and I think he's the least egregious of the main characters, but he doesn't have a lot going for him. Inosuke might be introduced in a way that's worse than, or at least on par with Zenitsu. Zenitsu was immediately loud, obnoxious, and annoying. Inosuke was immediately loud, obnoxious, and an asshole. His primary introduction is him stepping on the back of a little girl who was thrown to the ground. He also beats the shit out of Zenitsu when he won't fight back just because he's protecting Tanjiro's box. His general lack of interest for the safety of those around him when he wants to fight whatever is in front of him isn't an appealing character trait, and while he does calm down slightly as the series goes on, he doesn't really grow out of that. I get it. He was raised in the wild, so he doesn't understand the most basic human interactions, but the extent that he goes to to fight the demons Zenitsu and Tanjiro paints him in the worst light possible. While his introduction makes him out to look like a shitty guy, I do like the fact that he kind of grows closer to his friends. He doesn't act like a shithead the whole time, but instead starts to want someone to care about him. He likes being praised and cared for by others, and I started warming up to him ever so slightly if only for the fact that he didn't constantly constantly keep doing shit to piss me off. My only real complaint about him besides his introduction is just that there's nothing to his character really. He doesn't have a lot of substance to his actions, he just wants to constantly challenge himself and get stronger. Which is fine, I would just prefer him to have some motivating factor behind it. Like during his rehabilitation training, he says it's too hard and just gives up. That's what bothered me the most. He's bummed out about not being able to beat a demon, but when his training can make him stronger, he quits and stays in bed all day. Wouldn't this be the type of thing that he wants to do the most? Get stronger? Then he's coaxed into training again with the flimsiest of reverse psychology, and all of a sudden, he's raring to go. I know it's supposed to be a joke, but jokes do affect the way that characters are characterized. If the joke makes a character seem stupid for contradicting ideas that are core foundations of said character, then that still reflects on the character poorly. Jokes can be written for characters and have them act completely in line for how they've acted the whole time. A concept Demon Slayer fails in on on multiple occasions. Character consistency is a huge problem for everyone in this show. The only one I can say it's really not a problem for is Kibutsuji. Kibutsuji, while every scene he's in makes him look incredibly threatening, he's not really a good villain. I don't know what he wants. Like, does he want demons to rule the world? Does he want to kill all the demon slayers? If so, why is he in hiding? Couldn't he just amass a big enough army and roll up on whoever gets in his way? The only thing I can say about him is that there isn't much to say about him. He shows up as a woman in the last episode. That was kind of weird, but like, whatever, right? He can do what he wants, I guess. For some reason, he's out in the middle of nowhere to kill Tanjiro's family. I guess he was just on a midnight stroll through the middle of the woods. For a main antagonist to be introduced this early on in the narrative, he really doesn't have any questions answered about him. So why introduce him that early to begin with? <sighs> I don't know, man. Let's just get this next one out of the way. Part 3. Nezuko. The reason I'm not including Nezuko in the entire cast section is because Nezuko is not a character. She does nothing, she reacts to nothing. She just mindlessly dawdles around like a child. Did turning her into a demon make her retarded? Cause she seemed more mature in the literal 30 seconds we saw her before she turned into one. 
I figured once she gets the thing in her mouth, she'd only convey her emotions through facial expressions and body language. I was like, huh, that's a lot harder to do, but if that's what you want to go for, then by all means. But I think the creators of Demon Slayer agreed with me and just cut out any type of reaction she has altogether. One of the most ridiculous examples of this is when Tanjiro comes home from the final selection. It's supposed to be this emotional scene of Tanjiro and Urokodaki crying because he made it back home, but Nezuko just has the same blank expression that she always has. She has no meaningful interactions with the other characters, so she doesn't have any any character traits. I would be more willing to give her some semblance of a pass if she kept her built-in personality trait of protecting humans. Like if she restrained herself from eating humans out of sheer conviction of not wanting to eat people and fought other demons because she thought it was the right thing to do, but because of the hypnotic suggestion or whatever, the only interesting character trait that she could have is stripped away for some horseshit excuse for why she doesn't eat humans. She had it too. She doesn't eat Tanjiro, and to go even further, she doesn't eat the humans that were being devoured right in front of her in the second episode. She had a strong character trait of resisting human blood, but the writer just had to fuck it up by throwing in some spell that took it away. Tanjiro says that he disliked Nezuko being under a spell, but because she has free will, then it doesn't matter. First off, that's not how that works. She specifically doesn't have a will of her own because she perceives things that are not real and acts accordingly to protect them. She sees humans as her family, which then she wants to protect, and for the sake of utter convenience, she sees a Roma lady and her boy toy as humans just because. Second off, if Nezuko did have any semblance of free will through this spell, then what was the fucking point of it? Why can't it just be a character trait that she wants to protect humans? Why does this show need to make up some horseshit magic excuse instead of it just being a thing a character actually does? I'm sorry, but your cutesy preteen waifu bait isn't a character. She's more akin to a dog. You know, a dog. That thing that rolls around and sleeps all day and protects the things it loves. That's all Nezuko does. She sleeps all day, rolls around when she gets bored, and protects humans. She's man's best friend, the only demon that goes out of her way to protect people. She gets head pats and told she's a good girl. Guys, she wears a fucking muzzle. Like for fuck's sake, you can't make this shit up. I have a dog. Her name is Minnie. Look at her, isn't she pretty? She's the most wonderful, sweetest thing in my life. She can be kind of an asshole and is probably too smart for her own good sometimes. She's also a dog and has actually more of a personality than a character written by a human, a real human being. Nezuko's lack of a character is one of the worst pieces of writing that I've ever seen. Everybody thinks she's cute, but I don't, so I focused on what made her actual character appealing and there's next to nothing. I don't know how she feels about anything in any situation. I don't know her wants and needs. I don't even know how she feels about being a demon. There doesn't seem to be any real downsides for her except the fact that she's got to stay out of the sun, so how does she feel about that? We're told she's patient through flashbacks, but is that something integral to her character or just an excuse the writers gave her so she wouldn't mind being told to sit in a box all day? This is supposed to be the female lead of the show, and the way she's handled feels degrading to women. I'm not the only one who thinks this either. I've heard the opinion elsewhere that Nezuko feels like an insult to women, especially since everyone loves her. Is this how you would want any real woman to act? Just sit there all day, not speak, and follow directions? And you might think to yourself, but it's fiction, she's just a fictional character. That doesn't excuse the fact that it's representing women poorly. Fictional characters are still based on real world people and ideas, and there are plenty of fictional characters that do feel like real people. I don't mean to sound like an SJW or something along those lines, because I'm sure the creator didn't mean for this to come off this way. Or maybe they did, I don't fucking know. Especially since the creator is apparently a woman. Something like this shows me, however, that they weren't thinking about how Nezuko is written and how that would reflect on females as a whole to a portion of their audience. Although, not thinking about how their shit is written seems to be their M.O. since now I'm gonna talk about part four, the world building. Believe it or not, the world building of Demon Slayer is the most crippling aspect of why I don't like this show. So much of it is glossed over and doesn't make any sense. The biggest offender of it all is number one. 
Wisteria. For those who don't remember, Wisteria is introduced in Episode 4 and is a tree that has flower petals that drive away demons. The specific Wisteria trees we see in that episode are for holding demons in one specific place for the final selection. The proctors of the final selection say that Wisteria blooms all year round. My question is, if demons hate Wisteria so much, why don't they grow wisteria in a ton of populated areas to make sure demons stay out? Just take some seeds from the tree by the mountain, plant them all over the place, and give it a few years to drive demons away. If it blooms all year round, use that to your advantage, fuckwits. This type of detail makes the Demon Slayer core look like a bunch of fucking clowns. You have the ability to grow demon repellent and protect as many people as possible, and you're just not fucking doing it. The Demon Slayer Corps isn't doing their job properly, and according to the Master, demon attacks are becoming more and more frequent. On top of that, the Demon Slayer Corps as a whole is getting weaker from a lack of talented recruits. So what's the problem with using another tactic to protect the public? Now, in Episode 4, Tanjiro claims that the Wisteria trees are out of season, never mind the fact that the Proctors say it blooms year-round, and if it's just those specific trees that bloom year-round and not all Wisteria, then why are those specific trees special? Whatever. Let's just take Tanjiro's word for it in this silly hypothetical. If wisteria can't be planted around populated areas, that literally doesn't matter because it's shown to be made into repellent in smaller sizes. In episode 14, Tanjiro's crow vomits up a tiny sack of it and gives it to the kid with special blood. If that tiny sack is supposed to keep him safe from demons, then why don't they produce larger portions of that and put it around cities and smaller towns, or literally any place with fucking people? They should take every precaution to aid the public with wisteria to fend off demons from populated areas, and they just fucking don't. This could solve so many problems, but is no one really thinking of using wisteria against the demons? Oh wait, they are! Shinobu makes poison out of wisteria that instantly kills demons. Why aren't they making something like Wisteria gas and spreading it all over Japan? If the Demon Slayer started using chemical warfare against the demons, what the actual fuck could they possibly do to defend themselves? I would say that maybe the gas could be harmful to humans, but thanks to my friend who reads the manga, and tiny spoiler for the Demon Slayer manga, it isn't. It can be injected right into the bloodstream and it isn't harmful. The idea that the Demon Slayer core hasn't eradicated all demons from the face of the earth is beyond me. Now if your logic for defending something like this is, oh, well then there wouldn't be a story, then don't introduce a concept like this. There doesn't need to be wisteria. If it breaks the world this much, then don't have it at all. Think of some other excuse for why the demons are trapped for the final selection and keep your homegrown demon repellent out of it. I could also see someone saying, well, maybe the government wouldn't allow them to grow the trees. That's an excellent point, and it leads me right into number two. The government is retarded. The existence of demons is the greatest plague in human history, and you're gonna tell me that the government of Japan does not recognize the Demon Slayer Corps? Are you serious? Okay, let's back up. Remember back in part one where I brought up the fact that some random old dude tells Tanjiro about demons and the Demon Slayers? Well, that just begs the question, does the general public know about demons? This isn't clear, because some do and don't. In episode 6 and 7, Tanjiro helps a man who just lost his fiancé to a demon. That dude tells everyone she just randomly disappears, but they think he's either crazy or he did something to her. This is where I first had the thought. Couldn't this just be explained by saying it was a demon attack? Apparently, girls have gone missing for weeks now in this town, and no one thinks it could be a demon? Does that idea sound too preposterous even though we have the Demon Slayer Corps running around? Or are they supposed to be a myth too? The guy recognizes Tanjiro as a Demon Slayer, but is that because he knows they exist, or is he just guessing? Here's a quick question. How do most people become part of the Demon Slayer Corps? Like, not only do we see tons of groups of normal Demon Slayers, but we also see their cleanup crew guys. And that's all we've seen in this one tiny portion of Japan. There's gotta be guys all over the place. Japan is huge and there's demons everywhere. How does a normal person find out about the Demon Slayers? Like, 
Tanjiro had his family killed. Zenitsu was just recruited because he had a debt to pay. Inosuke randomly happened upon a member and took his stuff. If all these types of scenarios can happen, there's no possible way that the general public doesn't know about demon slayers. And if the general public doesn't know about demon slayers, how in the fuck do they not know about demons? Do they think these guys with swords are just running around for fun? They're all just playing a game? Ah uh, yeah, a good old game of let's hunt and decapitate a demon, my favorite. You could say that people just think they're normal samurai, but demon slayer takes place during the Taisho period. I don't know how much you guys know about Japanese history, but samurai were outlawed before the Taisho period started. That's why Tanjiro and his friends get chased by the police in episode 26. In most cases, they'd be reported to the police for walking around in public with swords. This loops back to the whole government issue. The demon slayers, the guys who protect everyone from fucking demons, aren't recognized by the government. Do people really not know about demons? Aren't demon attacks becoming more and more prominent? Wouldn't that clear up a lot of confusion about what these attacks are if you just let the public know about the existence of demons? Wouldn't they take more precaution and prepare themselves for demon attacks? In episode 26, Zenitsu explains that it can't be helped if the government doesn't recognize them, but it definitely totally can. There's no logical reason that the government wouldn't accept the help of demon slayers if they knew that fucking demons actually existed. No government official has experienced a demon attack or even heard of one? Nothing at all to tip anyone off about how serious of a problem this is and how there is a dedicated group of swordsmen that take care of the problem? Upwards of 40 people have been disappearing off some fucking train and nobody is questioning whether or not there's something wrong? Nobody had a family that worried about them when they didn't show up after their train ride? Nobody had any type of eyewitness report? There's nothing that could hint at something being fucking wrong with this train? That's just one example too. There has to be tons of cases like this all across the country. Here's an idea. Why don't you just show the Emperor of Japan a demon? It can't be that hard, right? You guys capture demons for the final selection all the time. Just do that shit again, but show it to someone important. You could walk into the Emperor's palace. Since no one could stop you, you have fucking superpowers. Throw the demon at his feet and say, hey, if this dude goes out in the sun, he'll literally disintegrate. And if they don't believe you, just push him out in the sun and watch the dude burn. That way, they know demons exist and can help you provide aid to the people. The police wouldn't hassle anyone wearing a demon slayer uniform because they know, hey, that dude is protecting my life. I shouldn't bother him. Maybe you could also convince them that planting wisteria all over the place probably isn't a bad idea. The fact that the demon slayers aren't trying to force the government to help them is bonkers. Again, the greatest plague in human history and we're all just gonna accept the fact that nobody knows about it. Wisteria and the government's retardery are narrative-breaking elements to the story, and it's all passed over without giving it a second thought. The writer did not think about the ramifications of things like this, and for me to just ask a few questions about how the world works, all for it to fall apart, says a lot about how much thought actually went into it. Number 3. The Power System I still don't really know how most of this shit works. Like, you do the breathing technique and that makes you have super strength, but then there are also different types of breathing? But then those different types of breathing also correlate to a certain type of swordsmanship? So there's no base type of breathing to learn without having to learn how to use a sword first? But even then, not all their abilities are based off of using their swords? Inosuke somehow has sonar vision through his self-taught breathing style. How'd he figure out how to do that? Are there other abilities like that? I don't fucking know, man. This shit isn't properly explained. From what I've been told, it gets explained later in the manga, but why isn't it explained up front? Why don't you just tell me the rules of your power system so it makes sense to me? Here's something I'm still confused on. Are the effects real or not? What I mean by that is, when Tanjiro swings his sword, is there water actually coming out of it because of his breathing style, or is it just some flashy thing the animators wanted to use? I've been told that it's just an effect and that it isn't real, but Tanjiro traps the arrow demon's arrows in his water current, so that looks real. A bunch of spiders jump onto Zenitsu and he explodes with lightning and shit. You're gonna tell me that's not real? Then what is it? 
See, I don't even care if it's real or not. Like, there's demons running around. Why would I give a shit if Tanjiro could use water magic or not? It's just because this isn't explained that I never know what's actually happening. For example, Nen in Hunter x Hunter has hard and fast rules on how it works, what you can do with the different types of it, and how everyone's abilities are produced from it. Everyone who's seen Hunter x Hunter knows Nen is cool because of this. It's probably the best thought out power system in Shonen. Demon Slayer doesn't have any hard and fast rules for its power system though, and very little of it is explained thoroughly. That comes off as lazy writing to me, especially when you have something like Part 5. Episode 19. This is the big one. The big reason that people threw Demon Slayer into the best anime of all time conversation. The reason that, for what felt like months after it ended, I couldn't escape this show. And after watching it, all I was left with was confusion and anger. Not even in the sense of asking myself why this was so popular. I mean, that was some of it, but more asking myself what just actually happened. I have never, in my life, ever said what the fuck is happening so many times over a sudden boost of power like what Tanjiro gets. Tanjiro gets his ass beat through the whole fight, and as he's about to die, he suddenly remembers his dad doing the fire dance of the sun or something. He then remembers the fact that his dad did a special breathing technique to be able to do the dance forever. He then miraculously starts using the breathing technique perfectly with no prior training in it. At the same time, Nezuko suddenly learns her demon blood art, which can apparently explode her own blood. And then, with the super fire dance bullshit, and Nezuko's bloodbending, they cut Spider Boy's head off. The actual amount of random sheer luck that goes into killing this bitch is astounding. Not only does everything happen at the pinpoint perfect time, but it looks so flashy that most people won't even notice that it doesn't make any sense. I know what anyone could possibly say. It's anime, bro. Random power-ups happen all the time. No, fuck that. This is sheer randomness for no reason. Every aspect of this victory comes out of nowhere. No pre-established setup to the power, not even a slight mention. No training and feeling like he's got a power deep inside of him. Tanjiro doesn't even know how the fuck he did it. Nothing. This victory feels completely unearned, and it's not even a victory. Spider Boy cuts his own head off, which also doesn't make any sense. I thought he said his body was more durable than any thread he manipulates. Then he cuts off his own head with them? Those two things don't really add up, do they? I'd take either one alone, honestly, but no, not both. This is just lazy writing. Everything that happens in this fight is by sheer coincidence. How am I supposed to take it seriously? Like, yeah, Tanjiro really put his heart and soul into a fight he was losing until some bullshit happened. Really inspiring. I don't see how this fight got everyone so excited. I don't even think it's that well choreographed. It's one of those things where most people won't take into account any other aspect of how terrible this fight is just because the characters are moving fast. The background is almost completely blacked out. There's no sense of environment or space, so the characters just look like they're gliding from one area to another while you're blinded by all the flashy after effects. People said this could be one of the best fights of all time, but I don't even think it's the best fight in the show. I like the bongo guy flipping rooms around until Tanjiro could catch his footing enough to find an opening a lot more than Spider Boy's tantrum over not having a cool sister. Yeah, not only do I hate the way the fight happens, but I also hate the flimsy stakes it's predicated on. Rui is a monster. He's killed probably hundreds of people over his lifetime, whether they were innocent or trying to kill him. He's also an abuser. He invites other demons into his family and forces them to fit certain roles. When they fall out of line, they get punished or killed. He doesn't understand what having a true family means. He's forgotten. Every attempt he's made to have a real family has ended in failure. Why is it then, when Tanjiro, the guy who he sees has a real familial bond, tells him what he's doing is wrong, he picks a fight? You could say that he has to prove his ideology right, but is that the case? He's seen time and time again that all of his attempts have failed, but refuses to listen to anyone else. 
See, this is my problem. The way it's written is supposed to be this battle of ideologies between Tanjiro and Rui, true bonds with others versus forced roles in a family. This approach doesn't work though. Rui has no credibility to what he believes, so he can't win the ideological battle. There isn't a time where I think, huh, maybe Rui is right. That's how ideological battles work. When two sides explain what they believe, there has to be some credence to both sides for each other to think they're right. They both have to have had some success in what they're doing for it to make sense. You could argue that this fight is supposed to be more metaphorical in a sense. Rather than it being two opposing ideologies, it's more about what each fighter represents, and I would be willing to give it a pass on that notion except for the fact that Tanjiro and Rui both explain their feelings on why their respective ways are better. Not really in detail, but they outright say the other is wrong. When both sides explain their ideologies to each other, then yeah, it's a battle between ideologies. I say all this, but also, fuck Tanjiro and Nezuko. Their relationship is as bare bones as it comes. I could get a better boy and his dog story from fucking Airbud. The emotional weight of this fight is based around how strong Tanjiro and Nezuko's relationship is, but it's not. We don't see any kind of meaningful interactions between the two. Nezuko herself isn't a character, so there's no possible interaction that could flesh out the relationship because one side isn't doing anything. Nezuko protects Tanjiro from Rui's attack, but it doesn't really matter. She has nothing else to lose. She regenerates. Tanjiro doesn't. So yeah, she's gonna take an attack for him. Dogs protect their masters. My dog gets mad if people nudge me while I'm asleep. This shit happens. If you really wanted me to get invested in this fight, then you have to put the work into building their relationship. I know so little about these two individually that having the stakes of the fight based on who they are together doesn't make for a narratively satisfying fight. Nezuko's lack of character holds her back so much, but her brother's not much better, which finally leads us to part six. Tanjiro. Tanjiro is one of the most confusingly thrown together characters I have ever seen in my life. He's portrayed as this lovable dork. He wears his heart on his sleeve, and he cries a lot, and he's the sweetest, kindest guy on the block. But he's also kind of dumb, and awkward, and silly. You might think, what's wrong with all that? And there isn't anything wrong with it. In fact, it's a trend I've seen, not just in anime, but in tons of other media as well, to have this quirky dork that's cute and kind and makes everyone feel good. My problem with Tanjiro is, first of all, the way the story goes about characterizing him is all over the place. But the thing that really sets him back for me is that because Tanjiro is the sweetest guy around, the message the show sends to me is kind of uncomfortable. In the early parts of the story, Tanjiro's character is all over the place. In episode 2, he's about to kill the demon that attacked him, and he has a near panic attack over it. He's sweating and shaking, he's breathing really heavy, and he has to try and convince himself to do it. Something like this should be a moment to build his character, but what are his hangups about killing him? Earlier in the same episode, he slits the thing's throat without batting an eye before he realizes it can regenerate. Even in episode 1, he throws a fucking hatchet at a human man in an attempt to hit him. So, why is he now scared of killing demons? But you know what? Okay, I can suspend my disbelief over something like this. If this is something he has to grow from now, I'll roll with it. Oh, wait! It's not! Because after the two year time skip, he's totally cool with killing demons now. Why did we just skip his growth as a character through this training arc? It's not even really a training arc either. Tanjiro becomes a master swordsman in one episode. All that work is basically skipped over to rush the plot. But it's not the fact that we skip most of his training that makes me irritated. It's the fact that up to that point, I still don't really know who Tanjiro is, and the time skip is making it seem like he's changed a lot. For example, in episode 14 of Yu Yu Hakusho, we get a couple scenes explaining that Yusuke has been off training for 6 months and what he did during that time. It's explained a little bit and then we move on to more important things, but by that point, Yusuke already had an established character. I know him. I know what his problems are. I know the most important things about who he is as a character, so skipping months at a time doesn't bother me because Yusuke is still himself at the end of it all. 
Demon Slayer expects me to buy into the fact that Tanjiro in two years has become a master swordsman, or at least good enough to be considered for joining the Demon Slayer Corps, and that he's matured in such a way that he's basically better than all of Urokodaki's former students. I didn't really know Tanjiro before this, so how am I supposed to connect with his growth after it? If anything, I'm confused on how they're treating him like he's more mature now, considering he was fairly mature when he was living with his family. What's changed exactly? Is it because he's preserved through training he didn't expect to make it through? I never got the impression that Tanjiro was quick to give up. Is it that he's not scared of killing demons anymore? Well then what was the catalyst that changed his mind? We never see him worry about that shit ever again. Each episode has moments that tell me things about Tanjiro's character, but none of them follow through to make them his defining traits that he has to grow from. If the main focus of his little training arc was to overcome his fear of killing demons, I'd totally be on board with that, but I have no clue how he's grown as a character. The one character trait Tanjiro has that persists through the entire story is his kindness. In fact, Tanjiro is so nice that when he shows any other emotions, it feels weird. Tanjiro shows other emotions so little that it becomes hard for me to believe that he has any other type of emotion besides being a super nice cool guy or being a crybaby. In episode 11, he gets mad when Zenitsu doesn't want to help him because he's scared, so Tanjiro makes an apparently super mean face. I say apparently because we don't even get to see what his actual reaction is. And all I'm left wondering is, is this something Tanjiro would actually do? The show has conditioned me to think that Tanjiro displaying another type of emotion is out of character. And this moment is supposed to be played for laughs. It's supposed to be ha ha funny joke, but it directly harms the way I've been told to look at the character the whole time. Very, very rarely does Tanjiro get mad, but for this reason, it's never that believable. His kindness also makes him look dumb compared to most of the other characters. I've heard the claim that Tanjiro is such a nice guy that he only knows how to respond to Inosuke's belligerence with kind words, but that doesn't make me think he's kind. It makes me think he's an idiot. When your main character can't read the room and respond in any other type of way besides, lol, forehead, just be kind, this isn't a character I feel like I know because his entire personality just boils down to being kind. All his kindness leads me to my biggest problem with the character, and now we have to talk about the difference between empathy and sympathy. Tanjiro can be both empathetic and sympathetic while having two very different results. Empathy comes from a place of mutual understanding between people emotionally, and this doesn't just relate to sadder emotions. Whatever a person is going through, if you've gone through the same thing, that means you can more than likely understand them. You can get any type of emotion they're displaying because you've been there. My favorite scene in the show is of Tanjiro showing true empathy for another person. In episode 7, the guy that Tanjiro helps lashes out at him. He clearly has a visceral reaction to Tanjiro's advice about continuing to live on, and that makes sense. He just lost his fiance. What I find endearing about this scene is Tanjiro's reaction. He doesn't defend himself, he doesn't explain his situation, he doesn't respond at all and he doesn't need to. We as the viewer know what Tanjiro has been through, and while I don't connect with his struggle all that well, this scene communicates the best character traits Tanjiro has to offer. All he does is give a warm smile and moves on. He knows exactly what this guy is going through and responds in the kindest way possible. That's believable. That's real. Raw emotional interactions between characters, that's what makes good storytelling. This is one of the only scenes in the show that I actually like. The problem is when we confuse Tanjiro's empathetic kindness with his sympathetic kindness. I don't think it would be out of character for Tanjiro to show sympathy, but the way he does it is unsettling. Sympathy is when you feel sorrow for another person's misfortunes. When people have bad things happen to them, it's normal to feel bad for them, but you're not necessarily able to understand what they're going through. That's the difference between empathy and sympathy, the ability to emotionally understand people. Tanjiro shows empathy in the scene in episode 7. All other times, he shows sympathy, and it's for demons. For most of his fights, after he's won, there's a little backstory for the demons. It's supposed to show you how they became the way they are now, but it does it in a way that's trying to make you feel 
bad for them. When Tanjiro kills the Morph Demon during the final selection, we get a snippet of his past and how he had an older brother that he seemingly killed. Like, the kid was always afraid and found comfort in his older brother, then he becomes a demon, kills him, and it's sad, I guess? My question is, why are you trying to make me feel bad for demons? Is it because they're not all inherently evil? Tanjiro doesn't know this guy's story. Why does he feel bad for him all of a sudden? He goes so far as to ask God to reincarnate him and make sure he doesn't become a demon again. Like, what? Tanjiro just got mad at the fact that this douche killed his ghost friends, so why the fuck would Tanjiro feel the slightest bit of remorse for this guy? He taunted him, mocked the death of his friends, gloated about how he was going to kill him, all of which he got mad over, and then he turns around and feels bad for the guy. That's a really poor way to go about characterizing your main character. Like, I'm all for sympathetic villains, but the show does not in any way make me feel bad for him after what he's done. Why should Tanjiro? This happens on multiple occasions, and Tanjiro never knows the backstories of the demons themselves. He just sniffs them, says they're sad, and feels remorse for their deaths. Which, by the way, a little tangent here, what the actual fuck is up with Tanjiro's nose? I get Tanjiro has a good sense of smell. I get that it can be useful for tracking people. But please explain how you can use it for things like determining a person's emotional state, or if they're lying or not. Like, whenever there's a question that needs to be answered, you can't just magic up the excuse, oh, Tanjiro has a good sense of smell. It doesn't make sense. How can he smell the fucking finishing strike while fighting opponents? Are we really buying this? Having a good sense of smell is one thing, having magic nose syndrome is another. Anyway, Tanjiro's sympathy also detracts from whatever other emotions he rarely shows. In the spider forest, the mother snaps the necks of a bunch of demon slayers right as Tanjiro is about to save them, and he gets so pissed about it, even Inosuke can feel the pressure from him. Then, when he goes to kill her, he realizes she basically gives up and wants to die, so he gives her a painless death. He's doing her a kindness to some extent, but she still murdered a bunch of his co-workers, so like, why? Tanjiro seeing the humanity in murderous monsters detracts from the fact that they are murderous monsters. It makes whatever emotions he had leading up to their deaths meaningless because he consistently shows remorse for them by the end, making me feel like all the anger he felt before was just there because he needs to have some type of reaction. How about you always have his emotions be consistent so I can get a feel for how this character actually reacts to hard situations instead of just being one note all the time? The worst offender of this is by far Rui. When Tamioka kills this guy, Tanjiro puts his hand on his back because his dead body was giving off the scent of grief. Are you fucking kidding me? Do you feel bad for the guy that just tried to take your sister away? The only piece of your family you have left? The only thing that keeps you going? He tried to take her away from you and you feel bad for him? You don't think maybe he just feels sad just because he's dying? That never crossed your mind? Then, to make matters worse, we get the most bullshit scene of Rui reuniting with his family. This dick should not get any semblance of a happy ending. He goes to hell alone. That's what happens when you kill hundreds of people. You fucked up. Just because you feel sorry at the end of it all doesn't change anything. At this point, Tamioka says the one thing I needed to hear someone say. Fuck sympathy for demons. Tanjiro responds to this with his reasoning for feeling sorry for demons. That is, that demons aren't hideous monsters. They're hopeless and tragic creatures. He'll always feel sorry for the demons who regret their actions because they were once human too. Okay, in no way are demons hopeless creatures. They do have the ability to make their own choices. Tanjiro has literally met demons that don't eat people. His fucking sister is one of them. The demons he's killed, who definitely tried to kill him first, by the way, I don't know if you guys remember that, all made the choice to kill people. It doesn't matter if they were once human. They made their choices to kill and get what they deserve. One of the only reasons the Hashiras let Nezuko live is because she hasn't killed anyone. 
Finding a balance between hating demons should be what Tanjiro is all about. The fact that he knows some demons can be good is what makes him stand out from the rest of the Demon Slayer Corps. Their need to avenge humans no matter what and his knowledge that demons can act differently should be able to coincide with one another. The only problem is that demons do have to actively make the choice not to harm humans. Like Nezuko, even though she really didn't make the choice on her own and it's aided by a spell. So whatever cruel actions they take should be answered with death. Even if they were humans at one point, would we feel sympathetic for some human psychopath that murdered a bunch of people but felt sorry when he was killed by the police because he had some fucked up past? No, we wouldn't. It unfortunately happens more than it should, and we never feel sorry for those types of people. Maybe we feel sorry for the fact that they didn't get the help they needed before they committed a crime, but that's not what Tanjiro is doing. With Rui, he felt sympathetic for him because his body smelled of grief. Tanjiro doesn't know his story at all. He doesn't know why he's grieving. Again, it could just be because he's dying that he's grieving, but Tanjiro would never know. It'd be one thing if Tanjiro felt sorry that the demon never got any help like his sister and chose to kill people, but he's not. He feels sorry that they're a product of their circumstances, something we are all accountable for. Fictional demons and real humans alike, we all can make choices to better ourselves and have to accept help when it's offered to us. We have to be held responsible for our actions. Feeling sympathy for someone like Rui feels like the show is apologizing for him, but it's way too late for that. Every time Tanjiro sympathizes with a demon that just tried to kill him, it sends some really weird messages that I don't agree with. These demons are killing innocent people. The show shouldn't even try to apologize for their actions because we know things can be different. The idea that some people agree with the show's logic makes me think that nobody has actually thought about the message this show conveys, whether it intends to or not. Part 7. The Popularity I would not have made a video about this show that is this long or even in general if the show wasn't as popular as it is. I wouldn't, and I completely acknowledge that. I wouldn't go through this much effort to tear apart a show I hated that wasn't this popular. Any criticism I might face that says I'm shitting on the show because of its popularity is entirely valid. But with all that, I have to say, no one else was stepping up. I haven't seen any analysis videos that really break down what is wrong with this show. I've seen tons about why this show is fucking awesome, and I don't want to take anything away from the people that did make videos like that. I might not agree with their opinions, but that doesn't mean their videos are bad. My point is, I couldn't sit around and have the vocal minority be pushed away like they weren't there. There needed to be something to tell people all the problems with Demon Slayer because in my experience, talking to some friends and other people, once they were told what the problems were, they thought to themselves, huh, maybe the show isn't that good. What really irks me about this is that it wasn't done sooner. The damage has already been done. Demon Slayer has won tons of awards from different outlets. It won Best Animation of the Decade from Funimation's award. It won Anime of the Year at the Crunchyroll Awards. These are things you can't take away from it now. It'll always have these accolades. And this might be the most popular show we've seen in the past, who knows, 10, 11 years? You have people like Ninja saying it's his favorite anime of all time, the biggest streamer in the world. You even have mainstream guys like Brendan Yuri coming out and saying he's rewatched the show a few times because he loves it so much. This show has reached a massive audience, and those guys recommending the show mean something. It really does. I'm not going to say those guys have bad taste or anything. It doesn't matter to me what they watch, but it does matter to their audiences. Those people care, and if they like the show as much as those who recommended it, they'll recommend it to others too. That's how this shit works. Even still, through all that, I can't let the vocal minority be drowned out. I'm a part of it, so making something this extensive and long-winded was necessary to me. I want people to be able to look at criticism of this show and maybe think about it. Right now, we are accepting mediocrity. No. Below that even, Demon Slayer isn't even mediocre, and people love it. 
Why? Because it's pretty to look at? It wasn't even the best looking show of last year. We had Mob Psycho 2, Bungo Stray Dog Season 3, Fire Force, Black Fox, all these shows I thought looked better than Demon Slayer. And that's just from the stuff I had time to watch. I have no idea what could look better than Demon Slayer, but I'm guessing there could be more. So go out there and watch more shit, guys. I'm sure there's tons of stuff you can find that's prettier. I believe in you. Part 8. The Conclusion I want to reiterate my sentiment at the start of the video. I do not begrudge anyone for liking this show. I don't want to take anything away from you. Maybe I can make you think a little more about what you're watching, but if you still find value in a show like Demon Slayer, there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe you love how cute Nezuko is, and that's all the reason you need to like her. That's totally okay. Maybe the world building doesn't matter to you, and you can look past it because there are other aspects you do appreciate. That's totally cool too. I will respect whatever reasons you have for liking this show as long as you respect my reasons for disliking it. Just because I attack something you like doesn't mean I'm making a judgment about who you are as a person. We can disagree on things and still get along, guys. It's honestly not that important. It's just a TV show. <sighs> and with that, I think I'm done. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and share it around. If you want to stick around, subscribe to my channel for more stuff in the future. Maybe go check out some of my other videos I've done, and go follow me on Twitter. Love and peace, everyone.